Hello again and welcome back to the layout. So this layout update is going to be for January of 2018 and before we get started I just want to go over a couple things. First off, uh, Happy New Year to you all. I hope you all had a great holiday season and spent lots of time with your family. And then uh, second off, I'd just like to apologize for the lack of layout updates, I guess. Um, I guess the last one was in August, which is quite a long time ago and quite a lot has been accomplished over that uh, period of time. So we have a lot to cover today. And uh, without any further ado, let's get going. So I guess we'll start here at the gates and I'll give you a better view of the upper level gate here in a minute. But both gates are now complete and they required quite a bit of work in order to get them uh, operating smoothly. So probably the most noticeable thing for some of you might be the track. Um, the set of track going over the gate or the lower level gate used to be on 2% Woodland Scenics risers. Now obviously those are gone now. So what I had to do is I had to take up the track from the gate all the way back to the switch over here. So instead now I have the grade um, on the main structure of the layout. That way once it comes down around this curve down the 2% grade it comes onto a level surface right here, which then continues to be level right across the gate. And all that's preventing is um, issues with the gate sagging a little bit, which will cause a uh, difference in height between the main layout and the gate. And that will cause derails and did cause derails um, on the previous uh, design of the gate. Um, so I'll go here, go across to the other side of the gate and I'll show you what I did um, to help it run smoother. So we're here on the other side and I doubt most of you will remember but last layout update I was talking about putting a new hinge in, um, a bearing style hinge that has zero friction and like zero wiggle room which is another issue uh, that I was having with these gates was there's too much play in the hinge. So I was able to compensate for that and I was able to keep the piano hinges um, but we'll start off just before I open up the gate um, the style of hinge that I'm using now is different so this is just a basic latch uh, gate latch and it's nice because I put it on this angle here so when you close it it really sucks the whole gate right in which stops it from moving like you have to you have to really bump into the gate to misalign the rails which is nice because as opposed to my last uh, latch uh, sliding latch that I was using you could blow on it and it would misalign the rails another thing I did is um, compared to the last uh, gate design I only had one set of screws uh, lining the rails and they were about this distance apart so now I added an extra set further back which will really ensure that these rails don't move because what I noticed is that when I took up the track even though these were soldered the rails were soldered to the screws if I pulled the um, the track away the rails were actually still able to move um, and were able to bend away which was probably causing a little bit of my uh, alignment issues so I'm glad I got that sorted out and um, saw that that was a problem. So I did add an extra set of screws. It doesn't look beautiful, but at this point, after all of the troubles I've been experiencing with these gates, I just want it to work. And then I can now just kind of blend it in later on. Um, so, and I'll actually, I'll show you the last latch I used. Um, this was one that I found and it worked except for the fact that um, there's too much room because this this little latch here is on a rail and there's too much play in that rail um, which again caused some alignment issues so another thing i added was this little bracket here and i have some more brackets on the other side just to help keep this whole gate aligned so when the gate comes in closed um, and as you can see, it's still a little bit snug, which is I'm all right with. 
because that way it, uh, it stops it from being misaligned. But that bracket helps guide the gate in and then the lip on the bracket catches it from over aligning, um, which is nice. So I've really tried to make this gate pretty much bulletproof because I really don't want to deal with it again. Another thing that I did was I added more of a lip on the gate. So that goes over onto the layout another probably two inches as um, it did previously. And then I also added another um, section of plywood there that I could screw the screws into. And now flipping around here, another thing I added were these little aluminum plates here. And all this does is when the gate comes in to close is they rest on the bench work right here. And that what's that, what that's doing is it's stopping the gate from sagging on one corner or the other, which again will cause alignment issues and um, create derailments. So I, I still have a little bit of work to do because I found that if I put another uh, block here that this one can come up against, that will help align the rails again and um, Again, just make it more bulletproof. And here's the upper level gate. So everything that I showed you on the lower level gate um, has been replicated up here. So you have four sets of screws. Um, you have the aluminum plates, same style latch, um, extended the lip, and you have the bracket here as well. The only thing I have left to do with this is add fascia. And the other difference is the track is still on risers. However, I've made sure that the track comes level before the edge of the gate. That way I don't experience any um, height differentials that will cause misalignment. So I thought the gates were a big enough project until I began experiencing issues with the grade. Um, before my grade was a 2.5% steady, 2.5% um, grade and it was about a 45 foot run. Now, as you could probably imagine, after a certain distance, gravity starts working against the train and I actually was experiencing stalls. Um, no matter how much head end power I had, which meant I had to put a DPU on, which I don't really want to do for all my trains. So this was the next big project. And when I say big project, this was a big project. Like one of the biggest I've ever had to do um, in one, one shot. So I installed a helix and it does about two, it does two full loops and it gets it up um, probably a foot and a half, which reduces the grade percentage to a steady 1% all the way up um, or a little under 1%. So this actually goes into the other room. There's a utility room um, beside this room. So we're in the other room here and it comes out the wall right here, does a full loop, goes back through the wall over here and then comes out the same hole and back into the same hole. Now it's not, it's not a standard loop helix I guess you could say I had to add a little straight section in here to allow the bench work uh, or the helix construction to clear this stud um, which isn't a bad thing because I was able to put re-railers in here um, both on top and the lower section which is good for any cars that want to skip off the rail um, they'll hit the re-rail and pop back on the track. So that's kind of just another fail safe. Um, but even before I built the Helix, I had to actually lift the floor up. So you can see here, I have some basic grid bench work covered in plywood. You can see I left a little hole there for me to stand. Um, I don't really like, I probably could have extended the floor so I can walk all through there. But as you can see, we're kind of in the attic. So, um, these are all the trusses to support the roof and then it just kind of gets complicated. So um, instead I just kneel on there and do the work that I need to do. The helix still requires a little bit of 
tweaking. There's a few spots where um, my bench work affects the track work. It sags a little bit. and So there's going to be a little bit of shimming required. And I also noticed that there are kinks in a few spots. So I'm going to have to stretch those out by cutting the rail and splicing it back together. So um, that's pretty much the helix. Nothing too exciting. But uh, certainly something that benefits the running capabilities of my layout. So once the track comes out the wall, goes into the curve here, and it, it just does the same same uh, track plan as before, but I had to lift all of the sub road bed up um, a few inches all the way through. You can see I spliced together a two by four right here, um, and it's pretty much the same all the way up. This project was, a headache at most times um, just because the height between um, the track level and upper level bench work especially when I was working um, underneath it I couldn't get any of my tools in there so half of the stuff is glued and yeah it was just a headache and having to lift all this sub road bed up um, a few inches all the way to the top um, that was quite a headache too because I had to adjust quite frequently in order to make sure that everything was level but happy that project's out of the way now and like i said with the helix there's a few areas where the track is kinked so it's the same out here i just have to uh, do a few minor track adjustments and then this grade should run flawlessly i hope so another major project i worked on was finalizing the wiring um so First off, I had to build this sliding drawer here. And then from there, I was able to install everything permanently. So I have my command station there. I am gonna eventually convert that to a booster and I'm gonna get the new Digitrax command station. Uh, I think it's the DCS 240, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I'll be getting that one and using that as my uh, main command station. Out of the command station, you have your PM42 and the Acculite's breakout board, which just simplifies wiring. And those are all my buses for the lower level. And then these are all my buses for the upper level going to another Acculite's breakout board. And that's where the other PM42 is gonna sit. Now, I originally had two PM42s, but one of them that I received was actually faulty. So what was happening was the trains uh, were traveling in either direction, and as soon as they got into the same block, that block would um, trip um, and shut that section down. And if I held the locomotive while it was running, the PM42 has a series of lights that show where the short is, what block the short is in, and it would just went wild. So after messing around with it for quite a few hours, um, I was able to come to the conclusion with the Digitrax tech support that it was a faulty board. Um, so I'll be picking that up today and installing that probably tomorrow, and that will be complete. Over here is the power supply, and that just runs around into the command station um, and uh, that wire there, that's the ground, or actually that's the external power supply, sorry, for the PM42s. So the PM42s, for those of you who don't know, can be used as an auto reverser. They have four blocks. So you might be able to see there are these four black boxes here. I believe our capacitors maybe, and um, those each resemble um, a block. So if I have a train derailment or something shorting the tracks in one block, the trains running around the rest of the layout shouldn't be affected theoretically. And that's what I've seen so far. So pretty happy with that. Um, and yeah, I'd, well, I recommend the PM42 for anyone with a fairly large layout. Now we're looking at where all the wiring comes in. So that uh, white bar there, that's just the uh, power bar for the external um, power supplies and the wire that hangs down there. Eventually, um, 
well, in the near future, I'm going to splice into that and put um, some light switches and mount them into the fascia. And so it just looks a little more finished and easy on off sort of uh, scenario. And this here is all of the bus wires, the red and black, and then the white and blue are my accessory bus lines. Um, so the upper series of wires is the upper level, lower series of wires is the lower level, and then they all feed into these um, power blocks or bars, whatever you want to call them. And these uh, are just here to simplify wiring a little bit keep it neat and tidy and then I also labeled all my wires so that way I can trace the wire back appropriately if there is any issues and they all feed in through this 2x4 here once again uh, just to keep it um, neat and tidy because I well I know with my last layout um, the wiring was quite a disaster you could spend hours just trying to trace one wire back to the source to uh, to figure out the problem. So I like the way it turned out. I think it's going to be uh, quite a quite a good thing for the future. So moving up to the upper level now. Um, again, I'm going to have to freehand this because my tripod doesn't reach that high. So now that the upper level gate is installed and the track is laid across there permanently, that um, makes the upper level loop complete including the connection to the upper level to the grade. Um, I installed this track here. This switch here will eventually go to the pulp mill where all those boxes are stored. And this just wraps around like so and joins into the switch here. And that's another thing I did was I spliced in a few switches in various different locations. For example, here and here I installed two switches uh, this one is for the yard, this one is for the passenger siding. That is the other end of the passenger siding. And sorry for those who have motion sickness. Um, I also installed this switch here. And actually on the lower level, I installed this switch as well. And all those switches were just switches that I was able to salvage from the last layout. So I had to do a little bit of work to them um, to ensure that all the rails were aligned properly and. Um, so on and so forth. So this next project I'm going to show you here um, was a bit of a spontaneous decision on my part. Um, some of you may remember that the backdrop for the upper level yard was quite a bit shorter. It was almost about half the size as the backdrop uh, that goes around the upper and lower level. And the reason I did this is so I could see a little bit over the wall because um, I didn't know if I really wanted to have a wall completely blocking my view of the other side of the, the layout. Um, but yeah, I decided to extend it just to make it all look um, even, a little more finished. Obviously, I still have a lot of work to do here. I have to do a lot of um, drywall taping and um, whatnot just to smooth it all in and, and uh, make it look more finished. And I got to paint it, of course. And the reason why I did that um, was so I could install a valance all the way around the layout and make it look um, make it look good. Because if I had the valance um, dipping lower down uh, in this section here, there wouldn't really be one enough room to work in there. And two, I wanted a valance because the lighting in this room, especially when it's dark. Um, isn't the greatest because most of the room is um, lit up by the skylights. So I completed more or less the main structure of the valance on, the, on this middle portion of the layout and I still have the other side of the room to do which is going to be a little more of a challenge because I have the, um, the angle where the roof comes into the main structure. So. I'm going to require a little more cutting, a little more thinking. Um, so that's the next big task. And of course, same thing on the other side. I extended the backdrop and then the valance also extends onto this side. And the valance is going to have uh, LED strip lighting inside of it to just 
focus the light onto the layout and it'll also make it look a little more finished as I mentioned and um, I still have the fascia board to put up there but uh, I probably won't do that until the main construction of the valance is complete. And the way I'm constructing this is just a simple two or a one by four um, grid construction. Probably could have gone one by two for the most part, but honestly, the one by twos that um, are up for purchase at Home Depot, Rona, and all the lumber um, companies in my area they just really don't look that great even the one by fours are a little sketchy because they're all warped and they don't look the greatest but um, I was able to find some half decent ones in the pile that I can construct the balance with another noticeable thing is fascia so after I finished the uh, grade construction with the helix I started to install fascia on this side of the layout and as you can see I've um, contoured it the way that the scenery is going to look um, eventually so it's going to be very steep terrain very lots of rock faces steep hills embankments and it's going to kind of resemble the Fraser slash Thompson Canyon region that some of you are probably familiar with here in BC beautiful scenery up there. This, this area I'm going to focus a lot of attention into because I really want to make this a focal point of the layout. So once I started installing the fascia on that side, I decided to carry on with it because I liked the way that it was uh, looking, giving the layout a little more finished appearance. So I completed fascia around pretty much the entire layout. Still have a few things to work on. Um, if you include the uh, fascia for the valance. So it is pretty much, well for the layout section, it's pretty much complete and I'm happy the way it turned out. So we will, um, I'll give you a better look at the other end of the layout room here. So just like the grade, um, the fascia is contoured. Um, to the way the scenery is going to sit on the upper level. The lower level you probably noticed um, is all flat for the most part. There's a few little um, lower sections in the fascia where I plan to put like a drainage ditch or something but for the most part the lower level is going to be industry, town, flat, flat level ground um, whereas the upper level is going to be more of a mountain terrain uh, lots of forest, lots of rock faces, that sort of stuff. So, um, the lower level, I mean, they both require the same amount of work, but obviously the upper level and the grade took a little more cutting and thinking about how I wanted to, the landscape to sit. Because once I cut the fascia, it's pretty much final unless I want to chop, uh, make one of the hills a little smaller or something like that. So one of the smaller projects that was actually brought up when I was installing the fascia was extending the bench work in two places. First section here, and then we're gonna swing around here. And the second section was right here. Now the reason I had to do that is because this hardboard material uh, is 1 8th of an inch thick, and it didn't wanna bend around this corner and around that corner and back out again and same for the other side it just wasn't flexible enough and the material was just snapping right in half so I brought the bench work out and uh, yeah I didn't really want to do that because it was just more work that I had to do but I guess now that it's done I'm happy and it'll give me a little more room for scenery especially in the intermodal area because that area is going to be pretty packed being that there's an intermodal and coal unloading. So I'll able, be able to store containers or something in that area to make it look less cramped, uh, which is good. And now for new products. So in my absence between this layout update and last, I picked up a few new products. And obviously most of you will know by now that uh, there's some pretty major releases from Intermountain and Scale Trains. So right here, um, you can see that there are two Intermountain 
ET44ACs, number 3000 and 3023. These are both the early series um, ET44ACs, which means that they have the square exhaust stack. Um, I think it's 3068 and onward. They have tapered exhaust stacks, which um, follow the same profile as the radiators in the back there. Um, really, really, really nice locomotives. Um, definitely some of the most detailed models I have um, to date. The, it's almost brass quality for plastic. Intermountain did a spectacular job on these and their prototype, um, each road number that they, or road that they did is prototype uh, specific. So the CNs have the red marker lights on the front and rear of the locomotive and um, all the correct prime mover sounds and everything. Uh, rolling bearing caps on the locomotive, which is, I believe, a first pretty much for um, HO scale. So really, really awesome models. Um, I might do a review on these. I know I always promise reviews, which eventually I'll get to, but uh, it's just a matter of time. Um, I might do a review on these, but I don't know if it's worth it because there is a ton of them already on YouTube um, since these were um, much anticipated models. So besides Intermountain, I also picked up two uh, Scale Trains ET44 ACs. Um, originally I was supposed to get all um, Scale Trains and I, I originally ordered some Intermountains but the price for the Scale Trains with sound was far better than Intermountains. However, the hobby store that I go through, there's a little mix up in the orders, which was completely fine. Um, and I ended up getting two of each. So this is the box the scale trains come in. Intermountain, just a standard Intermountain box. Um, yeah, Intermountain did a really great job packaging and detail. Detail is of same quality um, as the Intermountain. So there's a few minor differences, like uh, the paint tone is just a little bit off, but nothing super noticeable. Um, this box here is actually another CN locomotive number 30, uh, 3068 rather. Um, and I just have this in the box because I don't really need it out right now. And behind that is what we call the blue whale I guess. Um, that is a tier 4 demonstrator unit. Now I originally got this because um, there's a section of my layout, which is the branch line, that is going to be catered to BNSF, and then there's going to be an interchange point where BNSF accesses the CN slash CP main and does um, uh, switching work in the yard. Um, that'll be for another video, though. Um, and this was originally going to run on BNSF, which they still do, but recently, um, since I bought this, CN actually... Um, has a lease for a bunch of these units and I actually overheard maybe that they purchased some of these units. So these are have been seen kicking around on uh, CN lately uh, as well as uh, city rail um, units. So I'll probably have to pick up one of those eventually but this unit's going to be nice because it's going to be interchangeable between running with my CN locomotives and my BNSF locomotives. Um, and again, great detail, uh, completely prototypical, uh, just an overall great looking and running engine. Um, and behind that is the first of quite a few that I am slowly buying. Um, that is a Scale Trains rivet counter crude oil tank car. Um, and just like the locomotive, detail is absolutely spectacular on these. Um, rolling buried caps, the whole nine yards. Super, super impressed with scale trains. Well, that pretty much does it for this layout update. Um, I know I covered a lot and it's probably a lot to take in, but uh, the layout is moving forward. And I know I keep saying this every layout update, but bench work is almost complete. Had I not um, extended the backdrop and put a balance in, I think it pretty, would, pretty much would have been more or less complete. Uh, but 
I don't know, just another one of those decisions that I made that oh, that'll look, make the layout look a lot better. So um, I'll be continuing the Valance construction and by next layout update, I should have that complete and um, have the lighting all installed and the backdrop should be painted and the fascia should be painted, I hope. Um, so hopefully I don't delay a layout update for too much longer. Hopefully I'll get one up before June, but we'll see how that goes. Um, and once again, I hope you enjoyed this layout update. If you have any questions, comments, concern, please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below. Leave a like and please subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching and have a great day.